Cody, folks. So few cinematic images are as iconic as King Kong clinging to the spire of the Empire State Building, swatting at planes as he roars into the Manhattan skyline, and while this scene has captivated audiences for decades, it also raises a very curious question, like how would that really work? Meaning, what would the structural implication of such a feat uh, really be? Could the Empire State Building withstand the load of a giant ape scaling its facade and reaching the pinnacle? In, in this video, we'll dive into the engineering marvel that is the Empire State Building, estimate King Kong's weight and impact, and analyze how the building's structural system might respond under the extraordinary scenario. Standing over 1,400 feet tall, the Empire State Building is an icon of 1930s architecture and engineering. Back in 1931, the building was constructed using a steel frame, nowadays a rather mundane footnote, but at the time was a novel pursuit in skyscraper construction. While most architecture in all of history before it used a load-bearing wall system using primarily stone and brick as a structural system and an architectural facade, the taller you need to go, well, the thicker your walls need to be. Or else it demands other thrust-resisting elements like buttresses to aid in stabilizing the system. But the Empire State Building uses its steel frame structural system to support the stone facade intermittently at each level with wall subframing that rests on floor beams which span to vertical load-resisting elements like columns that take the loads down to foundations and allowing the perimeter walls to be much thinner and much lighter, which is important given that even with all this economizing, there's still approximately 26 million pounds or 13,000 tons of Indiana limestone cladding the tall building. And all that is supported by a steel frame that uh, I don't know too much about. So I tried finding design documents and I'll be damned, but apparently these structural drawings aren't available for public use. Um, super weird that the documents for the icon of a New York skyline can't be accessed by the public. So, so weird. So I can't share any specific analyses, but I've learned enough about the system to get about to a few conclusions, which I'll describe in more detail after we meet the big fella, Kingus Kongus himself. So engineering is about the specifics. Uh, for example, I get a lot of calls during building construction from contractors asking me if they can put a forklift on a structured floor to do some contractor stuff. And every time I have to ask, like, does it weigh 2,000 pounds or 20,000 pounds? So the specific case I wanted to use for this design check was the 2005 Jack Black, Adrian Brody, reasonable CGI film. And based on visual estimates and scaling comparisons, Harambe Supreme appears to stand roughly 25 feet tall when upright. And while regular gorillas on average stand about five to six feet tall and weigh three to 400 pounds, and since weight increases with the cube of an organism's linear dimensions, we can extrapolate that Kong's massive size would result in a disproportionately high weight. At 25 feet tall, approximately 4.5 times larger than a typical male gorilla, Kong's weight would scale by a factor of 4.5 cubed, or roughly 91 times that of a real gorilla, placing Kong's weight at an estimated 32,000 pounds. And stepping back for a second, uh, maybe that isn't all that huge. I mean, in the 2005 film, you can barely even notice him scaling up the very tall tower. So now I'm thinking, if we're cracking open this can of worms, we might want to look at some other King Kong movies while we're at it, and go figure the film that started the big monster genre has like a dozen iterations. But luckily for my sanity, there are only two that actually entangle with the Empire State Building, the 2005 version, and of course the original from 1933. All the others are either set in Japan, a fictional island, or cave, or are apparently unwatchable animated dookie. Uh, sorry to all the children in the audience who are offended by that. I mean, I, mean, I could be wrong. I just read summaries and 25% uh, positive Rotten Tomatoes reviews. Oh, I, I guess technically the 1976 film does conclude in New York, but here Kong climbs up the old Twin Towers instead, so I feel fine skipping it rather than uh, beating that very dead horse. Anyways, after all that added research, I come to find that the original King Kong is also uh, about 25 feet tall, though the visual consistency he's shown with is uh, much more varied and can often appear 50 feet tall or larger. And to the casual viewer, I'm sorry for all the rigmarole, but what is animated engineering analysis but pedantic? 
As Donkey Kong climbs, his weight is distributed over the areas of the building he contacts, and this includes his hands gripping the facade and his feet pressing against ledges or protrusions. Each point of contact effectively becomes a concentrated load applied to the building's exterior cladding. As mentioned, the load would be some fraction of George of the Jungle's weight, and with Anne in hand, I'd presume that we have at most three points of contact when stationary, or just two when ascending. So what about magnification for impact? When loads are applied suddenly to a structural member, the felt magnitude can often be much higher than that of the applied static load. So for our case, I'll arbitrarily grab an impact factor of two. If it's good enough for the impact of free falling elevators, it's good enough for me. Okay. So easy maths would make the assumed 32,000 weight uh, divided by the two points of contact then magnified for yeah, anyways, that's a reasonable number to make some assessments based on. Then looking at how the climbing occurs, one of the primary points for the king to get a grip is at the base of the windows, also called the sill, and here we get to think a bit more about how the facade works. So, as we noted before, the Empire State Building is wrapped with limestone cladding, but pertinent to the question posed is that the stone isn't totally continuous. Obviously, there are windows which punch through the perimeter, but additionally, the skin above and below the windows doesn't continue with brick. We actually have vertical stripes of facade materials alternating between stone in one stripe and aluminum panels and glass in the other. So if we're to assume a big gorilla foot comes down on the sill of one of these windows, it would be landing on this aluminum panel, which has very little design capacity. Facade materials like this are often only less than a sixteenth of an inch thick and would be quick to crush under the impact. But the panel is connected back to a wall frame system at frequent intervals with clips that are relatively low capacity themselves likely designed for the inward and outward pull of a few hundred pounds of wind force, not thousands of thousands of pounds of force pushing downwards. So King Kong's climb should be hampered a bit by the collapse of the aluminum spandrel panels with every grip or step. But let's say, then instead, he opts to find grip on the limestone facade. Well, again, we're trying to work without perfect information, but I would assume this facade material is quite a bit stronger. And just a 4 inch thick by 30 inch wide panel of limestone would actually have the compressive strength to resist King Kong's weight. So the issue here comes with the connection back to primary structure, which is often brick support angles at every floor, or each panel would clip back to the wall structure, and again, I can't say I have much faith in either system, which shouldn't have been designed for big monkey loads. Hey. However, going back to the aluminum panel case, just because an aluminum wall fails shouldn't necessarily mean that King Kong would have a great fall, or even if we make the leap in logic and say the aluminum panel is rigid enough or the connection was just over designed enough, following the load path inwards, Kong could find purchase on the floor system itself and apply the force of his weight to the perimeter structural beams. Now for this we're going to need some better info, and from the research I've seen, beams tend to span about 20 to 25 feet between the columns, with floor beams that are called things like 20i80, which I assume are just 20 inch deep I-beams that weigh 80 pounds per linear foot, at least that's how we designate our beams nowadays. Also, some photos I've seen show a wire mesh reinforcing cast in a slab that is formed by a clay or brick stay form flooring, likely a bit heavier than what we'd use in modern days, but in turn should make for a much stiffer floor and slab. Additionally, the steel beam does not appear to act compositely with the slabs, as I don't think composite steel construction was a standard practice until a bit more recently. However, it sounds like many of the beams are embedded in concrete. Now, not sure if that's intended to act together with the steel or is just a fireproofing material, but certainly an interesting detail. Something pretty notable for engineers, at least, is that this steel material is much weaker than the steel we use today. At the time of design, 1930s American Steel was making a transition from 16,000 psi to 18,000 psi strength steel as the standard building material. But oddly, New York was a bit behind the curve, and it was actually this project itself that helped push along the local building code to allow the stronger material to be used. Great news, but even still, the 18 KSI steel is just one third the strength of the steel used in most modern construction. So with this little excerpt of the design documents on the 42nd floor, it looks like we have at least one 20i80 beam spanning about 20 or so feet. 
Now, if we were to apply a 32,000 pound load in the middle of the beam, we'd expect an added bending moment of 160 kip feet, or about eight times greater than the floor live load it would have been designed for. Even with old school high factors of safety, we might be running into trouble. And again, if that load were applied to just one side of the beam, the demand on the connection between the column and the beam would be several times higher than the assumed connection capacity. However, back then they used these robust riveted connections in some conditions that may have had a good chance of resolving that added load. Okay, so moving on down the load path, if we get Kong's weight from the facade through the beam into the columns, well, an added 32,000 pounds on a column that's already resisting a few hundred thousand pounds of load might only account for a 5 to 10% increase on the existing frame and shouldn't cause much issue for the robust steel columns or any of the other broader structural systems like core walls or foundations. And another interesting facet to the design of the Empire State Building is that it's apparently incredibly stiff, meaning it doesn't move very much under the lateral loading of wind. According to a design textbook source, the lateral stiffness is expected to be 30% higher than the Willis Tower and 60% stiffer than the John Hancock Center. And some people have attributed this to the stone facade, but I don't believe that to be the case, likely just the over-design of a building that was designed and built in the span of just over a year. And some of y'all might have heard that back in 1945, a plane actually crashed into the Empire State Building. However, it was quite a small one and resulted in minimal damage to the structure. Now, I hesitated in even mentioning that because I really don't want to see the internet educated trutherism in the comments. Uh, please be humble. But I bring this up as a decent example as what is likely to happen in the event that the Beast of Skull Island makes his way to Manhattan, with the plane crash resulting in a crushed facade and exterior beam, but otherwise largely intact, more or less mirroring what we've seen in some napkin math. Okay, so let's say with either great luck or great difficulty, Curious George reaches the tip of the Empire State Building. Uh, first, it's worth noting that the spire of the 1933 looked a fair bit different than what we know it as now. The spire which King Kong famously beats his chest atop was originally designed to serve as a mooring mast for airships, but was renovated in the past with additional structure to serve as a beacon and broadcast antenna. So the spire he encountered isn't just an aesthetic addition, it's integrated into the structural system, transferring loads down to the core of the building. However, just as with the aluminum panels on the building faces, the metal panel capping the spire likely has little material itself, even if it has metal structure beneath. The framing would need to be so closely spaced, I mean, roof materials aren't expected just to see more than a few hundred pounds of concentrated loads of a working person. For example, the current antenna has a 200 20 foot tall mast which would apply similar loads to the roof of the spire however the connections have been engineered and installed by professionals i assume and may have required additional reinforcing within that metal dome now to wrap things up king kong's iconic climb up the empire state building is a masterclass in cinematic storytelling blending action drama and imagination from an engineering standpoint it offers a fascinating thought experiment showcasing the resilience of one of the world's most famous skyscrapers scrapers while giving me the chance to highlight the gaps in engineering logic behind something that seems so simple, and offered the chance to talk about the wall framing systems, something that when I started researching this video, I did not expect to explore. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, appreciate it for making it to the end. I'll see you in the next one. Adios.